but I was finally falling asleep when I heard something from above me moving, something in the attic. I had the most terrible feeling that no matter how nonchalant he acted, this man had bad intentions. She was being dragged into a black Honda by two guys. Listener discretion advised. You're just moments away from true tales of terror that will leave you breathless. From Disturbed Media, I'm your host, Chad, and this is Disturbed. Welcome back in, everyone. Thanks for joining me. Today, I've got one big announcement before we get into it. We just launched our brand new merch store. So if you'd like to snag yourself a Disturbed t-shirt or hoodie, head on over to the store at disturbedpodcast.com slash shop. We'll be adding more items in the coming days. And if you're in the fan club at the $5 or $10 level, you get 15% off any order. So take advantage of that offer by getting in our Patreon fan club. And with that, let's get rolling. Our first experience comes to us from Reddit user Ofath Awesome, and we find out that the sound you hear coming from the attic might be your worst fear. Performing this experience is Addison Peacock. I was 14 years old when I had to live with my grandparents. I had to live with them because my sister was in college and my parents were divorced. They lived in this old bungalow type house. It was one story and we have stairs that immediately go up to the attic. An attic which no one really uses. We just put stuff in there. It's too hot and stuffy up there. The sole window up there didn't really help. The attic had old creaky wooden floors that I remember that I had to polish with a coconut shell because that's how we do it here in the Philippines. That and my grandparents are very traditional. Anyways, my door to my room was near the stairs leading up to the attic. Like, you open my door and then face right, and then the stairs would be immediately right there. I hated that every time I left my room, because I would expect that something would immediately crawl down from the attic. One night, my grandparents had to pick up my aunt's family from the airport. But because of the hellish traffic here, They had to leave at 7 p.m. and their expected arrival back home would be at the most 5 a.m. So a 14-year-old girl would be alone at home the whole time. I told them I'd be safe here. We live in a gated community. We've got tons of guard dogs. Everything will be okay. Or so I thought. Before they left, we already had dinner, so I was stuck with cleaning the dishes and all. As I was doing that, I could hear a bunch of neighboring dogs bark a lot. I didn't really think much of it because the dogs always do that. When I finished cleaning up from dinner, I immediately had to lock every door and window and close all the lights before heading to bed. When I entered my room, the lights were open and it looked normal. My anime posters were on the wall. My closet was untouched. My bed was next to my barred tinted windows. We had to tint them because I was on the first floor and my grandparents wanted to make sure no one would peep in a young girl's room. They were barred too because my uncle, who used to use the room, always escaped through there to go to parties. This was my grandparents' solution to that. Nothing was out of place to alarm me. Everything was normal, until I closed the lights. As soon as I closed my lights, a silhouette of a man was illuminated by the streetlights outside. He looked like he had thick, curly hair and a skinny build. I thought I was having hallucinations. So I opened the lights again, and he was gone. I closed it again. He was back again. Opened. Gone. Closed. Gone. I sighed with relief. I was just tricking myself, I guess. Or something else was casting the shadow. I double-locked my door just to be safe. One with the doorknob lock and one of those door latches type locks. Then I tucked myself in. It was hard to fall asleep when a lot of dogs were barking outside. They weren't our dogs. It was the neighbors. But I was finally falling asleep when I heard something from above me moving, something in the attic. I pushed down the thought, I'm tricking myself again. 
I hugged my pillow. It's just rats, I said to myself. These rats seemed heavy and were also pushing furniture around. My heart sank when I heard them hurriedly go down the stairs and stop at the bottom. I covered myself with my blanket and I waited for something. I was also wishing that my parents had given me a phone at a time like this, but I only waited in bated breath. Suddenly, I heard my doorknob being gently fiddled. I wanted to vomit when I heard a click, followed by a quiet turn of the knob. The knob turned, but it didn't budge. When they noticed, they tried to push it. This time, I had finally stood up, shaking. I was a kid, home alone with no phone, no means of defense. All that was saving me was this thick door from the old days. I softly pushed my body up against the door and locked everything up again. I didn't want to make a sound. I didn't want to scream. I didn't want him to know I was here. I don't know why he stopped, but he did. I didn't go back to my bed. I just sat there at the door, waiting. It felt like forever. I heard footsteps go up the stairs, but I still sat there. I saw something move in the corner of my eye. There, out the window. The shadow was back. I forced myself not to look. All I could think of was, thank God they were barred. I don't remember what happened after that. I think I fell asleep or I was too scared to even think straight. I just remember the next day when my family and I were finally having breakfast. I casually brought it up. Grandfather, I think I heard footsteps up in the attic last night. My grandfather scoffed. It's probably rats. I never brought it up again. I didn't want them to worry. I probably was, but I do know this. Our dogs were caged up near the gate and were far from my room, so they wouldn't have seen anything. The only dogs who were near my room were the neighbors. Also, there was nothing outside my window that could cast a shadow that looked like a man. Lastly, the attic window was open. Support the show and get your very own shout out, ad free listening, bonus episodes, and more for as little as $3 a month. And the best part? When you join, you get instant access to all nine bonus episodes with a new one every single month. So here's a shout out to our newest members Jewel Quackenbush, Jane, and Laura Storbachen. So what are you waiting for? Our bonus episodes feature the most disturbing and graphic 911 calls. You won't believe what you hear in these calls, but they're only available in the Patreon fan club. So claim your access today at disturbedpodcast.com slash support. Next up, Reddit user Ms. Martinez 408 was nearly abducted from the park while waiting for her bus. Performing this experience is Nicole Doolin. So when I was in high school, it was my senior year. I was five feet three, about 95 pounds. I was at the park down the street from my house waiting for the school bus. Usually my boyfriend who already graduated would drive me to school, but he was busy. I later found out he was cheating. Well, there was usually a few of us girls there waiting, but this day I was the only one. So I sat at a bench and had one headphone in and one out so I could listen to my surroundings. I've always been cautious of what's going on around me. As I waited, a black Honda pulled up and I immediately noticed it. I kept an eye on it because I had a bad feeling about it. I wasn't making it obvious that I was watching it because I didn't want to look crazy. But after a few minutes, two big men got out. I immediately texted my boyfriend that I was at the park and these guys were creeping me out. Of course he didn't text back, so I copy-pasted the same text to my cousin who was home. I lived with my aunt and two guy cousins, unwinding down from the night shift. I wanted someone to know the car make and color, plus it was two men. Didn't get any responses. When they got out of their car, they started to walk towards me. So I got up from the bench and walked towards the street, because the bus was supposed to be there any minute. 
The driver actually ended up being a little late. As I stood by the street, these men walked up to me and I could feel the bad energy. One guy said hello as the other stood there staring me down. I just did a small smile and a nod, then looked away. Then the same guy, I'll call him number one, asked how old I was. I didn't respond. I could tell the other guy, number two, was getting mad that I wasn't feeding into it. Then number one kept asking me yes or no questions like, do you have a boyfriend? Do you live close? Do you do drugs? We have some, do you want some? And then number two asked me if I knew what the black market was. I felt a cold rush go over my body and I got the chills. Number two, who was quiet the whole time, started to tell me they just got back from Russia. But the way he said it was so scary, almost intimidating. I knew they were from somewhere else because they had strong accents, but I couldn't pinpoint the place. They kept telling me to go to their car because they had drugs. I said no thank you. Trust me, I wasn't a straight edge in high school, but I was not stupid either. I would never get into somebody's car that I didn't know. Then number one asked if I have a car. I said no, and that my bus is almost here, sorry, have to go. And by some sort of miracle, the bus rounded the corner and the guys backed off. They had been inching closer and closer as they asked me questions. But before the bus got to me, number one handed me a card and said he has a car shop and to call him sometime if I need anything. He even stated he'd give me a free car. The card looked shifty and I didn't want to grab it, but I knew I needed that number on it to report it. So I took it and they walked off super fast. Finally, the bus stopped and picked me up. As soon as I got on, I started to cry. I had a complete meltdown. It was like all of the adrenaline was keeping my mind and body aware and focused while the men were there, but as soon as I was safe, my body and mind gave out. Thankfully, there weren't many people on the bus, so the driver calmed me down before we took off, and I explained to her what happened. When she looked around for the car, they were gone. She said she saw them around me, but thought I knew them because they were so close to my person. The driver called into her dispatch, saying that there was an incident so that they could notify the school. She continued to pick all of the other students up, but when we got to the school, she walked me into the office. I was absolutely terrified to be alone. The principal came out and so did campus security. They were so sweet and gentle with me as they brought me back to the principal's office. Both were men and they proceeded to ask me questions about the men, their car and the questions the creeps had asked me. I cried the whole time. Then I pulled out the card the guy gave me and handed it to the principal. He looked at the security and said he was going to call it and act like my dad. So he did. It was on speaker, and number one answered. I knew his voice as if it was burned into my brain. It took everything in me not to have a panic attack. The principal asked the guy if he could get him a car at a good price, and the guy played dumb. The principal said his daughter, me, gave him the card. As soon as he said that, the guy hung up. They tried calling again and the phone was shut off, then eventually disconnected. I could see a shift in the principal and security as soon as the phone clicked. The security got on his phone and called the police and had them come to the school. It was as if they finally knew it was real. Like my crazy story wasn't made up. The principal excused himself and the security guard, and they talked for a minute in the hall. I could hear everything they were saying. She's lucky to be alive. This is serious. We need to call her parents to come get her. When the police got there, they came into the office that I was sitting in and asked me for the story again and in front of the principal and security guard. I feel like they wanted to see if I was being 100% honest, so I obliged. The officers were straight up with me and told me it sounded like they were watching us girls at that park because they chose the one day that one of us was alone. He also said the card was being used as bait to get me to go where they wanted. I felt sick. I couldn't breathe. The school called my aunt, but she didn't pick up. The only person that picked up first was my boyfriend. One of the officers talked to him as the other finally got a hold of my aunt. My boyfriend ended up picking me up and taking me home, and I cried the whole time. 
When I got there, my grandma, uncle, aunt, mom, and cousins were all out front. The women were all in tears and the men were livid, but worried for me. A week later, some girl at another local high school, not far from the park, was saved by other students. She was being dragged into a black Honda by two guys. The other kids stood up and grabbed her and pulled her out of their car. The principal called me into his office and that's how I found out. They also had the same offices there and had me choose the two guys out of a picture lineup. I pointed them out fast. They were caught. It was in fact those two guys that tried grabbing the girl. A freshman girl. I felt worried for her and sad she went through worse than I did. And I felt almost free again. Still scared, but not looking over my shoulder as often. I couldn't believe they were caught. After that, my family teamed up to drive me to school for the rest of the year. My boyfriend, now ex, also took me some days. I'm thankful to be alive and well. And I'm even more thankful that the girl was also saved by the courageous kids at her high school. Up next, we hear from Reddit user Trashtastic Takeout. A bizarre occurrence involving his father left him truly baffled. Performing this experience is Tom Aglio. First off, a little backstory on my dad. The man has so much character and color to him. Though he is mostly a chilled out grandpa at this point whose biggest offenses are the likes of placing a box of dead kittens in the topic hat when the family plays charades at the Christmas Eve get together. When I was a kid, he was a crazy person. He was an amazing father, honest to a fault and had character made of stone. He apologized when he felt he was wrong and he would sit and cry with you when things were eating away at your self esteem. However, as much as I owe him my morality and compassion towards others, I also owe him my extremely demented and nothing-is-sacred sense of humor. The man got more joy from life in tormenting his children than anything else. We lived on my grandmother's farm in rural Tennessee, and when the power would go out, which happened a lot in our area, he would dare me to run to the mailbox and then lock me outside. At 10 o'clock at night, when I'm about 10 years old, and he would laugh so hard I could hear him over my screams while I banged on the door from the outside, pleading to be let back in. He was the type of dad to wake you up in the morning by revving a chainsaw, change the clocks in the house to make you get ready for school at 2 a.m., and stand on the front porch in his tidy whiteies while you were getting on the bus in the morning and yell, I love you, I'm gonna miss you so bad, in a voice that could only imply that he was suffering from severe brain damage. In other words, he was always looking for a way to scare you, embarrass you, or just make you have such a crazy, unexpected experience that you would be guaranteed to remember him forever. And it worked. I love that man. Now, that was needed for context, and this story takes place in my second to last year at my grandmother's farm. I was 17 and had been working a job in my small town stocking beer coolers and mopping floors at the local gas station. I was driving home from work in my little truck at about 10 p.m., and as I pulled into the driveway, my headlights shone up the hill to my grandmother's house and panned down the hill to the edge of our single wide mobile home. I stopped immediately, all four tires in the driveway pointing straight to end of that straight stretch of gravel. I could see my dad. His old flatbed truck and my stepmother's minivan were parked pointing to the left at the base of our trailer. He was standing behind them, with his back to my headlights. Our chocolate lab, Cassie, sat at his feet staring intently at him, paying no attention to the vehicle entering her territory, which was highly unlike her. I only stopped because it was so late and so unusual for my dad to be outside at this time. It was in the middle of the week. He was usually passed out in his recliner wearing nothing but his underwear with the History Channel quietly rambling on about the Civil War by this time. I slowly proceeded down the drive. Our driveway was about half a football field in length, and as I drove slowly toward the bottom of the drive, my dad began to walk, still with his back turned to me, and step behind the vehicles, the height of my stepmom's van fully concealing him. It took another 15 seconds from that point for me to reach the end of the drive, and I pulled my truck in on the side of his flatbed, leaving me closest to the road. I grabbed my big gulp and got out of the truck. Dad? No response. Dad? Still nothing. Immediately I got a bit creeped out, but then thought to myself nearly as quick, 
This dude is trying to scare me again. He must think I didn't see him. I got down on my knee and peered under the vehicles, his left boot unmistakable. Cassie's back legs and butt right beside him, tail tucked between her legs. I hollered out, You're doing a crappy job of hiding, Dad. I can see your boot sticking out from behind the tire of the van. I watched as his left boot slowly slid to the right until it was concealed behind the tire with the other. Still no response. I called for the dog. Cassie! She turned and literally scurried beneath the vehicles to get to me as if she was under heavy gunfire. She was whimpering when she got to me and was acting very strange, as if she was terrified. She was acting how I would imagine a dog would act if they were constantly beat on, and I'd never seen her behave that way before. When she got to me and I placed my hand on her head, you could almost hear her breathe a sigh of relief. She was sticking to my legs like glue, and as I was still down on one knee and a bit off balance, she nearly knocked me over. I pet on her for a moment and tried to comfort her, but she seemed like she was afraid of something. With her tail still tucked between her legs, she pushed herself in between my legs as I stood up. It was after seeing how timid and odd Cassie was acting that I decided that I may be misreading the situation and I might need to get into the house. My dad was surely a prankster, but when he was caught, he was caught. He never drug things out once we caught on. He would come out and say something like, I guess you kids aren't as gullible as you used to be. I'm gonna have to start stepping it up a notch. Dad didn't drink much and never got drunk really, but I couldn't think of what the root of this odd behavior could possibly be, and it really started to weird me out. I made one last attempt at communication. Dad, I know you're there. I saw you when I pulled in the driveway. The jig is up. What are you doing out here? No response. I started around the front of my truck to round the vehicles and walk over to him. Cassie began to panic and whimper loudly, still glued to the inside of my ankles, crouched to the gravel with her head darting back and forth wildly. I stepped in front of my truck. I stand there for a moment in silence, waiting for something but not sure what, and then announce, well, I'm heading in, see you in a bit, weirdo. I turn to walk to the front porch, unconsciously building speed as I hit the first step. Cassie drops back and doesn't follow me onto the porch, but seems to sort of stand guard at the foot of the steps. Keys in hand, I'm already searching for the deadbolt key. Panic is building in my chest, but I'm not sure why. I hurriedly unlock the door and jump into the house, swing around, and slam the door behind me, locking the deadbolt all in one fluid motion. From behind me, I hear a voice yell, what the hell? I spin around. My big gulp drops to the floor and explodes across the living room floor. There sits my dad, in his underwear, sitting up from a deep sleep in his recliner. I begin to hyperventilate and yell through gasps of air that, there's a man in the driveway hiding behind the van. I thought he was you. I, I was talking to him, dad. I nearly collapsed into the floor. Within 15 seconds, my dad is running out the back door of the house with a spotlight and a handgun, still wearing nothing but his underwear. He was outside for what felt like forever. When he came in, he was pale as a sheet. He said someone was definitely out there, but he couldn't see them. He could hear them running, but when he pointed the spotlight in the direction of the footsteps, there was no one there. Crazy thing is, our trailer sat at the front of a 150-acre cornfield, and it was off-season, so everything was tilled down to the dirt. There was nowhere for anyone to hide. It was a terrifying experience, and I know it's one that seems easy to explain. My brain really wants to tell me that I just foiled a car thief or something, or maybe even stopped a possible home invasion. The thing is, though, my dad has an unmistakable posture and an even more unmistakable walk. I know those were his boots I saw under the van. I also know that if he had somehow set all this up, I would have heard about it for years because it would have been one of his favorite stories to tell. How he scared me so bad when I was 17 and how funny it would have been. He does tell people about this from time to time, but he always ends with the same detail. That it wasn't until he was outside running around in his underwear with a handgun that I realized that Cassie had been sleeping in the floor next to his recliner when I ran in the door. And finally, we check in with Reddit user Wolf Dream, and it's that one decision that can change everything. And join me in welcoming our newest narrator to the show, Rhiannon Mauschel. In 2008, I was driving from New Orleans, Louisiana to Eugene, Oregon. It was just me and my year-old pit bull in a 14-foot U-Haul truck with everything I owned crammed into the back, 
a fancy flip phone, and my printout of MapQuest directions. I think the first smartphones actually came out around that time, but I didn't have one. Cell phone service was also much spottier, and there were long stretches through the desert where I had zero service for hundreds of miles. I was driving a lonely stretch of highway through central Texas when I realized I hadn't seen a town or exit for a very long time, and my giant U-Haul was really low on gas. Just when I'm starting to freak out and seriously run out of gas, I see a small town coming up. I pull into this town and it is tiny. I was so worried about other things that I never did pay attention to the name of the town, but there were only about six streets in the whole place. I go gas up and am ready to get back on the road, except I cannot for the life of me find my way back to the highway. I circle the town around four times and start getting so frustrated because this is such a tiny town. How the fuck can I not find my way out? I can literally see the highway, but can't get to it. I return to the gas station to ask for directions. Now, when I got gas, I paid at the pump and never went in. When I enter for directions, there's a skinny, nondescript guy who has black hair hanging down in front of his eyes that looks like it could use a good wash. He's not particularly creepy, but a little rude. He never really met my eyes. He was looking down at a magazine. He gives me directions that don't sound right at all, and he's telling me to take a road that will get me to the highway in about 17 miles. For a moment, I am dumbfounded. Then I point out that I didn't drive that far to get from the highway into town. Why so far to get back to the highway? I can literally see it from the town. He is so casual, almost like I'm just an annoyance and can follow his directions or not. Why should he care? He gives me some explanation about the road curving around that doesn't really make sense. He still doesn't look at me. Just whatever, I gave you your directions and waved his hand in the direction of the door. When I got into the parking lot, my whole body started trembling violently, and my heart started racing, seemingly for no reason. I get into the truck, and as soon as I put the key into the ignition, I burst into tears. I had the most terrible feeling that, no matter how nonchalant he acted, this man had bad intentions. I didn't know what but I knew right then and there that there was no way I was going to follow his directions. Yet this was the only store in this little town and short of knocking on doors, no thank you, there was no one else to ask for directions. I decided I didn't give a shit if this town seemed like something dropped out of the twilight zone. I was going to drive around until I found my own way out, even if it took all damn night. Then, a big red beater of a pickup truck, as much rust as metal, pulls up and disgorged the quintessential Texan man, huge husky and in flannel and work boots. Without even thinking about it, I jumped out of the truck and approached him quickly yet warily. Looking into his eyes, I saw a kind human being, or at least I was hoping I did. I asked him if he could please give me directions to the highway. I told him I knew it was silly, but I just couldn't seem to find my way back. He looked concerned as I was visibly upset, so he made me laugh and very cheerfully gave me directions for a hairpin curve turnoff right at the end of a small concrete tunnel I had passed several times. He said it often confused travelers because it was so hard to see, they need to put up signs, etc, etc. With a sinking feeling in my stomach, I asked him how far in miles was it back to the highway? He laughed and gave me a funny look. Miles, miss. I'd say it's a quarter mile at most. You can see the highway right from here. At this point, I couldn't help it. I had to know. What happens if I drive? And I gave him the directions the man in the store had given me. Texas looked at me very intently and asked me how I knew about that route. It was pretty far out and usually only locals know about it. So I told him. He was quiet for a few minutes and then asked what the attendant looked like and if I had a map of the state. Nope, just my map quest, which wasn't helpful in this situation. He goes to his truck and grabs a raggedy local map from his glove box. Spreading it out for me, he traces the route I describe. The way the man from the gas station had told me to go led away from the town, away from the interstate, and led to seemingly the middle of nowhere. 
Texas told me that the road did go about 17 miles, right before it dead-ended in the desert. I asked him what was out there, and he told me that it was nothing but some junked cars and a few trailers and mobile homes, all owned by the same family. The family was known locally as troublemakers, meth heads, and alcoholics, and these were the nice things townspeople had to say about them. And the erstwhile clerk was part of this family and lived down that road. I'll never forget the look in Texas's eyes as he told me this. He also told me that I was smart to listen to my instincts, and he told me to be careful traveling out there. I don't know if the man from the gas station wanted what was in the back of my U-Haul or what was in the driver's seat, but thankfully I didn't have to find out. Oh, and I learned that sometimes angels look like ruddy-haired Texans with scruffy faces and rusty pickups. Thank you, random Texan stranger. You really saved my ass, and I will always remember you with tons of love. Sorry I didn't ask your name. You're forever Texas to me now. If you love our show, consider leaving us a five-star rating and review. Follow or subscribe wherever you're listening right now so you never miss an episode. And help us grow by sharing the show with a few friends. Musical score by Carl Casey at White Bat Audio and Co.ag. Thanks for listening. We'll be back next Thursday with a brand new episode. And stay safe out there, y'all.